Sorry, let me just try that again. Stop. All right. Hey there, I'm Natalie McLean, editor of Canada's largest wine review site at nataliemclean.com, and welcome to the Sunday Sipper Club. I have been thinking about this all week because tonight we are joined by the godfather of Zinfandel. His name is Joel Peterson, and he's right here. Oh, I always get the sides wrong. Welcome, Joel. Thank you, Natalie. I am delighted to be here. Boy, it's, a, it's amazing to be in Canada even when I'm not. <laughs> you are everywhere, Joel, and people better watch out. <laughs> no, it's great. You're actually joining us from, is it Las Vegas where you are right now? Actually, I am in Burbank right now. I am uh, near Universal Studios because last night we had this really wonderful charity auction and wine tasting on the back lots of Universal Studios. I was in the streets of New York City last night. Oh my goodness, you are just... At least the yeah. fake streets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, great. A fundraiser. So you were leading a wine tasting, I guess, was it? Uh, well, I was doing a wine tasting with many other people, and it's a okay. big auction. Uh, it's been going on for about 28 years. I've been here for about 20 of them. Uh, and uh, we made some significant process, progress in helping to find a cure for cystic fibrosis. So it's, uh, it was, it's been exciting. It's been fun. The auction's great. And there are just a tremendous number of really lovely people who show up at it, as well as all my winemaking friends. It's probably some of the only time during the year I get to see people that I really like, but don't get to see very often. <laughs> That's a very selective comment. Now, cystic fibrosis, this is sort of off topic, but I'm still intrigued because you have just so many interesting stories. Is there a tie-in for you? Is this a cause that's close to your heart? No, it's a cause that's close to my heart because uh, Alan and Barbara Balick run it. And Alan and Barbara Balick are very good friends. Uh, and over the years, we've done many things together. And this is really their cause and it's close to their heart. Oh, so they're good friends. Wow, we have people pouring in already, coming in the virtual door here, Joel. I know you can't see them, but I'm going to read you comments and tell you who's joining us live here on Facebook uh, live stream, on YouTube live stream, and Twitter through Periscope. Everybody, if you're just piling in here, uh, this is going to be a great Sunday Sipper Club. It's uh, we, we have Joel Peterson, the godfather of Zinfandel from Ravenswood in California, that winery. So many. Uh, Lee's welcome from Sudbury. Uh, Joel, just so you know, Natalie got me hooked on your Zin. <laughs> I feel like ah. I'm an enabler. I'm your, like, I don't know, a dealer. Um, especially the one from Lodi and our friends who live here. So Lee's actually takes a very big truck and goes to various liquor stores and, and buys for her and her friends. <laughs> and McLean, <laughs> and McLean is here from Halifax, and I am going to try to see tonight. the The comments come in so quickly. Um, I'm trying to see if I can see more than five at a time, but it may not be. So, folks, if you're just joining us here, please tell us where you're logging in from, what you've got in your glass. It better be Zinfandel, uh, or oh, here's here's uh, sorry, Paul from Virginia. Paul and Patty are back from. Suffolk, Virginia, they've been traveling for a while. Anyway, I've got lots of old friends here, um, Joel, just like you have in the industry. We, we come around this virtual kitchen table and talk wine every Sunday night at 6 p.m. So, any, everybody who's joining us, please feel free to just tell us where you're logging in from. So, Joel. This is, this is such a thrill, by the way, because isn't it fun? You know, I've been in this business for a very long time. And back in the old days, I mean, you had no way of doing this. It was like you didn't have a conference. There's no way to talk to all these people. And this is really exciting. I mean, like, I'm, I'm one of the graybeards. And to be able to be a graybeard and still be part of the uh, modern technical world is fabulous. Did you say you're one of the graveyards? One of the graybeards, yes. Graybeards? Oh, <laughs> not graybeards. No, you're not gone yet. <laughs> Sort of on trend, but not quite. Okay, so yeah, I love this too. I really do, Joel, because every week we get better at the technology. You and I were working out the sound and the visuals and everything else, and you just have to have patience with it. But the power of connection is pretty amazing. When, you know, I'm talking to you, you're in California, I'm here in Ottawa, Paul's in Virginia, Anne's in Halifax, Lisa's in is in Sudbury, yep. and there's many, many more people I can see you all. 
I can see how many people have joined us and are just uh, lurking in the background. That's fine. If you don't want to comment, that's all okay. But it's bringing us all together. So I love this too, that the technology can bring such um, an old world fascination and beauty um, and here in a, a, such a non-intimidating way, like we are all sitting at yeah. the table. Okay, Joel, back to you. Um, back to me. So you Joel have, me. <laughs> you have such an interesting story. I thought, well, I'm not going to have to work hard tonight. This man is just uh, just a roll of stories. So let's let's start at the beginning. So. 1976, I think, is when you started your winery. But you are, you are the child of two chemists. Your mom yes. was a nuclear chemist who worked on the Manhattan Project, and your dad was another kind of chemist who was working on something else. So major brainiacs. Um, and did you go into chemistry at first? I did. You know, I um, I grew up in this crazy household with two you know really superstar people who met it, by the way, at a, at a chemical honor society meeting, and I guess the chemistry was good, and that was the result. Uh, but, Birds in love. Uh, I love it. <laughs> <Ta -da. laughs> so, um, so, yes, I ended up uh, studying biochemistry and microbiology uh, when I went to college, and I really didn't expect to be in the wine business, even though my father had taught me to taste wine when I was quite young. Uh, we used to get together on Friday evenings before his tasting, and go through 10 or 12 wines because he thought a kid would have better words for wine than an adult. Uh, so if I said a Chardonnay tasted like apples, for instance, he would go out and collect different kinds of apples until we could actually sit down and smell these cut up apples and determine which was the Northern Spy and which was the you know, Golden Delicious all blind. You know? So next time we had a Chardonnay, I could say, Oh yeah, this one smells like golden delicious apples, and uh, and so forth. So and this was uh, just was, his own informal wine club. He was just doing this as a passion, not his profession. No, he actually he actually started one of the first wine clubs in San Francisco. You know, when my mother went out and found that bottle of you know, 1945 Chateau Neuf de Pop that changed that rocked their world, and then they got this case of wine that was a survey of France that included a bottle of 45 Ogre and a bottle of 29 Chateau Ikem for $15.40, uh, <laughs> they began to get really serious about wine. My father started a wine club called the San Francisco Wine Sampling Society, later, cha later changed society to club because I guess it sounded more intense. Equally um, catchy. And uh, he was writing a newsletter that he put out every month. Uh, and uh, it was uh, it was complex. I mean, he would write up uh, wines and he described them. And I remember he described the uh, the 1949 Chateau Rouget as smelling like the spars of the USS Constitution. The what? Now, the spars? The USS Constitution. It was an old sailing vessel, old Ironsides oh. in American parlance. Okay. Um, it probably meant piney and tarry and briny because I went and smelled the spars of the USS Constitution. It still exists in Boston. So what are spars? Uh, I'm not a sailing spar vessel girl. Spars are the things that go across the oh. mast in a sailing ship. Spar so and boom. They're the things that hold the sails. Okay, basically. gotcha. You um, were sniffing at spars at an early age. Yeah, yeah sniffing okay. at spars, yeah. But nobody understood that. So he thought a kid would have easier terms for wine. And that was, I was 10. Yeah, so I came in as the kind of the, the simpleton, you know, to simple fly language and make it basically more basic. So he was starting to do this. He wrote these newsletters on a monthly basis. He covered all the great regions of the world. There wasn't much happening in California at the time, so I really got to taste a lot of Bordeaux and Burgundies and German wines were really the core of it, some Italian. Uh, but it was, a, it was a learning experience. I ended up not doing wine. Uh, I ended up in medical research. I uh, was doing uh, uh, immunology research, stimulating lymphocytes, growing tumor cells, and doing things like that. Uh, uh, and then I ran into Doing a guy things named... like that, you know, <laughs> yeah. dismiss. Well, you know, this is, you know, I could talk, I could talk about that, but you know, and the beauty is that a lot of the stuff that I was working on was really before its time in terms of the technological feasibility of it. And we have really moved forward with DNA research and uh, understanding how these things work in ways that we didn't before. So. I'm now beginning to see some of the things that I was working on coming to fruition in terms of uh, the kinds of therapies, the gene therapies and other things that are being 
looked at. So that's very exciting. But you know what? I'm really happy being a winemaker. I, you know, I think I got very lucky in that way. Uh, and interestingly enough, I'm going to take this on a little sidetrack because interestingly enough, I just got back uh, from Croatia. Uh-huh. And I got back from Croatia because I was part of a conference uh, that was put on by the Croatians called I Am Tributrog. And what that, does that is mean? also. How does that translate? I Am Tributrog? I Am like Tributrog. A- that because like... <laughs> the uh, the name of Zinfandel, the grape Zinfandel in Croatia, the original place, the home of Zinfandel, is Tribidrog. That's not uh, catchy. Yeah, that's not catchy. Tribidrog, it sounds like a bad player in a Star Wars movie, actually. It does. It uh, sounds like the Borg or something that will... Anyway. And if you, if you read Jancis Robinson uh, in her book on amphilography, where she lists all the grapes in the world... Uh, she doesn't list Zinfandel as Zinfandel. She lists it now as Tribidrog. Really? And, and that was because a university professor here, Carol Meredith, used DNA uh, to identify uh, Zinfandel and then Tribidrog and, of course, Primitivo. They're all in the same family. And at this conference, we had people from Croatia, we had people from Italy, and we had people from obviously the United States, myself, David Gates, Carol Meredith, were all there uh, to talk about this grape. And I learned some stuff that was fascinating. It turns out, you know, for a long time, we didn't know the history of Zinfandel. We didn't know where it came from. We knew it came from the Austro-Hungarian Empire to New York, to Queens, Long Island, but it didn't seem right that it was from Austria. And obviously it was from the Austro-Hungarian Empire because in 1820, when it got to the United States, uh, Croatia was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, But it turns out that this grape is much older. This grape, the first historical reference to this grape is in 1488. That's several years before Columbus sailed the blue to find the new world. Um, And it's a sale of a barrel of wine from Croatia to the Italians in Apulia, interestingly enough, because apparently there were some Croatian monks over there buying wine. So it's a very ancient grape. We also know even more about it now. It turns out that it was uh, the grape of the Venetian royalty, the, the princes and the dukes that lived on the Dalmatian coast. It turned out that the Dalmatian coast was controlled by the Venetians from 1400 until about 1800 when uh, Napoleon kind of dislodged them, uh, but they grew this grape. So if you went to a Venetian mass ball, one of those nice festive things, the wine you were likely to be drinking was infidel. Wow. You know, and, you know, and, so. and we have, just to let you know, people commenting and they're, they're loving your wines. Just, I want you to continue there, Joel. Paul is saying, yes, um, uh, they love besieged. Anyway, just the, the comments roll off very quickly. I want you to keep going, Joel, but I just want to acknowledge the people. And Carrie has joined us. She's uh, an LCBO product consultant, a fabulous taster. Um, yes, Carrie, we are saying Dalmatian Coast. So, so clarify there, Joel, um, Dalmatian Coast. That's that's kind of is their historical roots there for Zinfandel with yes, Kermit the Dalmatian. The Dalmatian coast is okay. right along the Adriatic. Okay. It's part of what is now Croatia. It's part of what used to be Yugoslavia. Mm-hmm. And it is a very interesting grape growing region. Uh, it turns out that there are 280 some odd different grape varieties in Croatia that are unique to Croatia. And that is not as many as Italy, which is 530, but it's nearly as much as, well, it's more than any place else, for sure. Uh, The other part that's really interesting about this is that through the use of DNA and the the work that they're doing um, with that, they have decided that there are uh, these sort of founder varieties in Europe, and there are like 12 of them that are related to all the other grapes that were, uh, came out of Europe. And Zinfandel is one of the founder varieties. So it's really ancient. It's, there's about 24 varieties related to it uh, in the Adriatic area. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of those that varieties is a grape that I ran into over there called Gurk, G-R-K, uh, which 
honestly is delicious, but it's white. It tastes like Greco de Tufo. It's fabulous. It's got great body. It's got these really pretty aromatics. It's very, very nice. So, so the Zinfandel is one of them. So Cabernet Franc, for instance, is another. Pinot is another. Uh, so there are there are these twelve grape varieties that are so sort of the, the 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 fathers, if you will, or the mothers of all the other uh, grapes uh, in in Europe. So it's it was one of these kind of places where you just got all this information. It was so much fun. Uh, it was like you know recharging my sort of information banks. Uh, so you know as you as you know Zinfandel came to the United States in uh, 1822, was yes. brought in by a guy named George Gibbs, okay, who was an amateur yes. geologist. We have to do a tasting rocks. at the same time. Like, so history, yes, but also we want to get uh, your comments. You want to drink wine? Oh. Yes. <laughs> yes. There will be wine, not just theory and academia. So, so I want you to continue with your story, but also sort of segue into what's this one can you see it that is vintner's blend zinfandel i believe oh, yes I, it is i can't quite see the label from my right. angle, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah you're right and uh vintner's blend zinfandel was the wine that i started making in 1983 okay uh, because uh, i had uh, started the small winery and was only going to make single vintner designated wines and i found out that i was quickly going broke doing that oh. so i needed a wine that I could get out of the winery more rapidly, but a wine that didn't cheat. Mm. I wasn't out to make a wine that was anything but delicious. Yeah. And so what I had to do, so I had to go to areas that I hadn't formerly worked very much in, Lodi and Amador and Mendocino, because the grapes were inexpensive. Right. And I had to use a little less oak in it, and I had to move it through the process a bit faster. But it's still made with native yeast. It still, you know, has French oak associated with it. So, so the wine is made precisely. Uh, but I could charge less for it, yeah. and in charging less for it, I could, you know, sell more of it, obviously, and it would sell more rapidly. Absolutely. Uh, so you in 1983, I, I started a small amount. I think I made a thousand cases in 1983. Uh, I think that wine ultimately became one of the most consumed infidels in the entire world. And Carrie is saying, again, she's a product consultant, it's a staple in her store, an excellent seller. You know what I, 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 sorry, I smell this and I want to tell a campfire story. I want to be camping, I, I don't like camping, but I imagine myself <laughs> to be camping and um, under a starry vault of uh, the night and I just love this. What it's evocative. So I want to tell a story, and I want to have maybe some barbecued meats and uh, bring a blanket, and uh, it's just it's, it's a lovely, delicious wine. Yeah, what a, it, when when I'm grilling burgers for friends and just throwing like those big juicy meaty burgers. I do a lot of buffalo burgers these days. Real buffalo? Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, bison, you know, American bison, you wow. know, uh, and. Uh, and this wine is delicious with it. Mm. It's got enough brightness and enough acidity so that it makes the burger taste fresh every time you bite it. That's nice. Wow. Okay. So is this the entry level? That is the entry level. Because yeah. I have one other that is not Zinfandel, but Petite Syrah. So this would Petite be a sort Syrah. of a Syrah sister or something like that right yeah they're 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 similar because they're made in that in a similar style from grapes that uh cost me a little less so most of that petite syrah is from lodi although some of it is from mendocino mm -hmm. uh, and petite syrah is a really interesting grape uh for a long time it was thought of as a blending grape for zinfandel and you right. see it in the old zinfandel vineyards a lot uh, but it's got this spice and it's got this pepper and it's got this round kind of juicy character to it um, it can be a mouth wrenchingly tannic if you're not careful. Uh, but mm -hmm. this one is not, this one is, you know, sort of a little softer because it does yes. come from a lot of it comes from the Lodi area. Very uh, flush. And, and what's about Lodi? Um, I know that area. I mean, I've heard lots about it, but what is it? It's warm, it's dry, it's arid. It's less costly than say Napa. Uh, it's, uh, it's the bottom of an old lake bottom. You know, if you look at California from a distance, you can see that it's uh, got this giant depression in the middle of it, which was a giant lake. Yeah. 
Okay. So really, you're looking, you're growing grapes in very sandy, sedimentary soils that are quite deep. Okay. And the grapevines get really big out in Lodi. Okay. And they have uh, fairly large clusters, uh, which means that the skin to juice ratio uh, is not you know, quite what it is in Napa or Sonoma. Okay. You do get cool evenings. Mm -hmm. So because of that, you get this less concentrated tannin feel. And so yeah. the grapes give you a softer affect, which yeah. is very nice in this particular case. Very plush. They don't, they're, they're not frequently what you would call profound like Barolo, but but they're out, they make a really nice beverage. Absolutely, like this plush, voluptuous, satin cushions falling back on satin cushions <laughs> Some, something like that well i want to see that on camera <laughs> <laughs> maybe another time <laughs> carrie our, our product consultant is saying yum that's a technical tasting term lee's in siberius is saying that she likes to pair it with pizza and lee's is also asking is this in the foothills not quite sure uh, this that. is not in the foothills. So this okay. is halfway between San Francisco and the foothills. Okay. So it's in that big, long, flat stretch uh, that uh, runs in the middle of California. So you would cross it if you were going to go skiing uh, and through the foothills. Oh, excellent. So it's not quite up in the elevation of the foothills. Okay. The, the, the only problem with the teats are on the foothills yeah. is that when you go up in elevation, you get more intensity of sun. You also go into granitic soils and berries get smaller. So the wine gets quite tannic. So uh, it's much more structural in the foothills than it is uh, out here in the flats. So granite creates more tannins? Granite creates better drained soils. It keeps the vines from growing as big. It keeps the berries smaller Sorry. and the, the smaller berries and the more intense sunshine thickening skins creates more tannin. Okay, gotcha, wow. Okay, so I'm just gonna just check in with people. I'm hoping that this week you all are seeing and hearing us much better. I think we have fixed the echo issue but I want to know, folks, can you just tell me below if the, the audio is much better this week, especially for Joel's side of things. I, I'm using a new software and I'm hoping that's working because I know it's super important. Um, <laughs> Lise, I'm glad you like the bow. It's better, she says. Oh, Gwen's here from Ottawa. Fixed. Sounds good. So great. All right. Yay. Oh. Technology, it's beautiful when all it's our, work. All our fussing around worked. I know, right? Oh, so good. Okay, so we've done these two. Um, so why don't we just um, have an intermezzo here. I want to know the story again, how Ravenswood got named. Because, uh, you know, Ravens, and I made the mistake when we were test calling, of saying the word crows. They are oh. crows. I know, and you had that gut reaction. <laughs> so let's just take it back. Ravenswoods are, ravens are smart. But what's the backstory on the name of this winery, please? Well, take, you'll have to take yourself way back, way back to 1976, uh, when I am determined through some strange uh, quirk of hubris uh, to that I want to make wine. Uh, and I have been working with Joseph Swan from 1972 until 1976. And so I figure I've learned the nuts and bolts and I can do this. So my hair is longer in your, than yours is now at the time. And my beard was a bit longer. And uh, I was living in Berkeley and doing lots of Berkeley things. And, uh, but I was you know, spending all my spare time with Joe Swan. So I had to find grapes and I went out and found grapes. Uh, growers were very suspicious of me. So uh, they didn't think I was going to pay, pay the bills. So I had to pay for these grapes in advance. So they were my grapes. I found these wonderful grapes on Dry Creek, uh, sort of the east side of Dry Creek, west, west side of Dry Creek. Uh, they were very old. They were exactly what I was looking for. They were Zinfandel. I wanted to make Zinfandel. I knew that it could make great wine if somebody paid attention to it. So uh, I contracted for the grapes, paid, paid, uh, paid for the grapes, 
the deal was the guy was supposed to put them in my 50 pound load boxes. He was supposed to load them on the truck for me. I was helping Joe Swan that day. So I was going to come up in the evening and pick them up. And I was, I waited until the last minute, honestly, to pick these grapes. Uh, and there was a rainstorm coming in and I knew I had to pick them. So I picked them, uh, or had Joe pick them and, um, got up there at six o'clock in the evening to pick them up. And sure enough, they were picked, but they were spread over four acres of vineyards in 50 pound wooden, you know, fruit boxes because of the rainbows, because there were like three rainbows. It was like pretty spectacular. <laughs> and the sun was going down and, uh, you know, the clouds were kind of opalescent, uh, you know, pink and orange. It was, it was really beautiful. Uh, but, I, but I'm in a state of panic because I've got to pick these grapes up. Isn't the days before cell phones? Remember those days? No. Uh, and uh, I had to pick up those boxes and I started running them down to the end of the rows and, you know, setting them down. Turns out you're picking up not four tons of grapes, you're picking up 15, 16 tons of grapes because you have to pick up each box four times. Oh. So you pick it up once, you put it at the end of the row, pick it up again, put it on the back of the truck, pick, get up on the truck, pick it up again and put it in place. Uh, so it takes a long time. And the clouds are moving in and it's beginning to rain and I'm thinking, oh, this is gonna be really messy. Uh, I just couldn't leave the grapes in the field. So while I'm doing this, these two huge ravens float into the tree next to the vineyard, and they begin doing this kind of strange chant. It's like this, this rolling throaty thing that ravens do. It's not like the caw, it's another voice that they have. And I'm thinking, this is really weird. Uh, but I continue to work you know, into the night and loading this truck and the ravens stick with me usually ravens come and go but this pair hung out and uh and i got the truck loaded and it was raining around me it didn't rain on me and i'm thinking this is pretty strange and you know i got the truck tied up went down to joe swan's winery the streets were wet but i didn't get rained on joe was waiting for me at the winery to help me offload the grapes and uh, so we we dumped them in the crusher as we took them off the truck uh, and about one o'clock in the morning, we finished up and the skies just opened up and it poured. I mean, just, it was crazy. So I'm lying in bed that night, you know, cause you can't sleep after something like that. You're exhausted, but you're just, your mind is going, you know, too fast. And I'm thinking there, what is this about? Rainbows, ravens. I'm thinking this is pretty amazing. And then I remembered, cause I'd gone to school in the Northwest that Raven was the, one of the trickster gods of the Northwest Indians. And I thought, wow, I was running my first trickster god. This whole thing was PFM, pure fucking magic. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, and I thought, wow, amazing. And I had been reading Carlos Castaneda at the time, you know, it's a story about a guy who, you know, takes peyote with a witch doctor so he could find his internal animal spirit. And so I'm thinking I'm primed for totem. So Raven became my totem. You, know, you are like, talking you know, fast right now. So you got the totem. <laughs> I got the totem. And um, by 1979, I had made several vintages, but I hadn't bottled anything and I was going broke and I couldn't afford to bottle what I had already made. And I thought it was like the end. I mean, it was just like it wasn't going to work out. And um, so a friend comes by, because he can tell I'm depressed. And he says, I'm going to take you to an opera. How would you like to go to an opera? I said, yeah, that's great. Let's go to the Barber's Seville or something like that. He said, no, I'm taking you to Lucia de Lamamore. I said, oh, great, everybody dies. And he says, yeah, he says, I want you to see how bad it can be. Maybe it'll cheer you up. Italians uh, have a knack for cheering you up, because life's always worse with them. Yeah. Romeo and Juliet, everybody dies. Yeah, yeah. So well, this is like Romeo and Juliet gone worse. <laughs> and. And the Romeo character is a guy named Eduardo Ravenswood, and he in the in the in the opera he falls on his sword. But it's based on a novel by Scott called *The Bride of Lammermoor*. Scott was the guy who wrote *Ivanhoe*, uh, and it's foretold that Eduardo Ravenswood will ride into the quicksand, uh, into the moor, and drown in the quicksand. And I thought, wow. I get ravens, I get angst with this name. Uh, I think this is the name for Ravenswood. Yeah, obviously I didn't drown in the quicksand. And uh, just shortly after that, I found 15 guys who were willing to sort of gather together with me and uh, and create this, you know, this wonderful vision of Ravenswood. So they were a murder of crow. No, it's crows. I'm back to crows. I should it stop was, that. Yes, but yeah, yes. Edgar Allan Poe. Quoth the yes. raven, nevermore, nevermore. Do, do you tie into that as well? 
Didn't tie into that at all. I mean, but there are so many wonderful raven images. There is Edgar Allan Poe, but there's also the two ravens that sat on Odin's shoulder. And since I'm of uh, Nordic extraction, yeah, he had two ravens he sent out over uh, the world, Ugin and Mugen, thought and memory. Uh, and uh, they brought him information and told him what was going on. So it's a, it's a great image, actually. I love all the mythology. I love that. If yeah. there's a backstory, oh my gosh, I'm there. Oh, so we've had so many more comments. I've been ignoring the comments. Okay, so Heather Proctor is logging in from Guelph. First time, she just stumbled on us. Uh, we love those Ravenswood wines. And she just found us. Okay, great. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, Carrie says, Ravens remember faces. True story. Ravens are true, smart, right? True True story. Ravens remember faces. And are they, there's... Okay, I know crows are smart too, and they have a thing for shiny th shiny objects, but what's the difference between crows and ravens? Uh, ravens tend to be bigger. Okay. Ravens tend to be smarter than crows. Okay. Uh, crows fly in flocks, ravens mate for life. Um, ravens uh, have territories, uh, however, they are sociable, and they will, if they have a meal, like a piece of carrion that's down there that's bigger than they can eat themselves, they will call in their neighboring crows for a feast. One presumes they have Zinfandel too, of course. Of course. Appearing <laughs> is always important. Well, because I've learned about hawks, how they mantle their food. Like they just sort of put their wings around, it's like back off. Yeah. <laughs> so, so ravens uh, are also figure heavily in legend because yes. of their unique personalities. Uh, and so in Indian legend, they found man in a pod on a beach and taught him how to uh, survive under the worst possible circumstances, brought fire and light and stole the star, moon and suns from the other gods so that man would have his entertainment. Good Lord, uh, that's great. Oh my gosh, I love that, that you've dug deep here. Um, I'm, I'm just going to check what's happening here. Oh, Carrie, nevermore, the raven, Edgar Allan Poe, yes. And Paul, he's enjoying baby back ribs with um, a blend of Ravenswood. Great match. I think I'm reading that correctly. Yes, baby back ribs would be a great match, would it not? For baby back ribs are a wonderful match, uh, and you know there are several wines that go really well with baby back ribs. Uh, in part because Zinfandel has this really pretty sweet fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, he made the blend he may be talking about is Besieged, which is. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a traditional California field blend based on uh, what California did pre-prohibition. Nobody was trying to make varietal wines. They were trying to make wines that tasted good right. and were particular for that location. And they planted grapes together called Zinfandel, of course, Petit Syrah, Carignan, Alicante Boche, sometimes a little Grenache, sometimes a little Syrah, sometimes a little Matara or a little bit. Uh, but those were the the blending grapes of California, and so Besieged is based on that concept. Okay, interesting. Yeah, because, um, so, I don't know if I've gone in sequence here, but um, would this one perhaps be next up? Uh, is that? that the Lodi or is that the That's Sonoma? That's the Old Vine Lodi. Okay, so Lodi, that would be a perfect next step. Okay, good. Tell us about this one and how it differs from the last ones we were looking at, this this one. Okay, the last one, the, the Vintner's Blend, is a California blend, and okay. that has uh, old vines in it from Lodi and Mendocino and Amador, and a little bit from Sonoma County as well. Uh, so it's a composite blend I put together to taste good, to not be kind of over the top and not necessarily represent anything except Zinfandel in California. So this is Lodi, so we've narrowed the range uh, in which I can play. So the average age of the vines uh, in this bottle is about 85 years old. Wow. Uh, it is all from Lodi. Lodi is this growing region which is due east of San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge, forms a gap in the mountains or the hills and the air flows in through and across the bay and actually up into an about an 11 mile stretch of Lodi, which would be sort of the, the, the north-south uh, diameter of it. 
in which you can grow good grapes. If you go too far to the south or too far to the north, the grapes begin tasting like brown sugar candy mm. uh, because it gets too hot. So this is an area where it gets warm days, cool nights, di good diurnal variation. It's been growing grapes for a long, long time. Uh, many old vines there. Much of this fruit during Prohibition, the reason they have so many old vines is because much of this fruit got shipped to home winemakers in places like Canada and places like the Eastern United States and Chicago and places like that. So these vines stayed in uh, up until fairly recently, maybe 20 years ago, most of this fruit was still shipped out. Uh, but it was kind of the playground of Gallo. Uh, if you drank Gallo Hardy Burgundy, a lot of the Lodi was in it. Um, and But people like Ridge and myself began to make wines uh, from this area. And they turn out to be really pretty. They're soft, they tend to be round, they tend to have a lot of blueberry tones to them, they tend to be spicy. And the winemaking in this is a little bit more upscale than the winemaking in, um, in the Vinner's Blend. Hmm. Vinner's Blend tends to be larger volumes, not massive volumes, but larger volumes. Mm -hmm. um, the Lodi tends to be smaller. Some of the tanks are punch down tanks, some of the tanks are pump over tanks. Uh, we're using a bit more French oak in this. This gets about 20% new French oak. Uh, and it stays in barrel, you know, not 10 months, but it stays in barrel for 14 months. So it gets a little bit more time to evolve and change. So we make it a little bit bigger than the, the Vintners blend, if you will, mm -hmm. but it also has got the character of Lodi. Hmm. So, can we talk alcohol, please? Um, we can. Yeah. So, this is 14.5. So, as I'm tasting these, to me they don't taste hot, but 14.5, and I've got some others here, 14.9. Holy smokes. Um, so, what makes a balanced wine, even if you're at high alcohol, and why do these wines have high alcohol and can still not taste hot. Okay, so let's talk about why they have high alcohol to start with, and then I will give you a whole dissertation on alcohol, which is great. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, so, Zinfandel is an uneven ripening grape. Okay. Uh, so, a cluster of Zinfandel has berries that are perfectly ripe, berries that are slightly underripe, and berries that are slightly overripe or slightly withered on the same cluster. Oh. If you pick Zinfandel too early, uh, and it doesn't have a few of these slightly overripe berries on it, uh, the ones have lower alcohols, but they don't have any kind of internal substance. They don't have any character or weight or any of the things that make them into really good table wines to make them competitive with wines that are from the Rhone or you know other good, uh, other good European wines, if you will. So you have to get some of that. The trouble with getting some of that is that these slightly withered berries have extra sugar in them. So you can pick the grapes at what you think is 23 bricks, which is might be where you would pick Cabernet. But actually in the fermenter, it ends up at 25 bricks. So there are two ways of dealing with that. Either you can pick earlier and get lighter wine, or you can try to find exactly the right spot. So you end up with alcohols around 14 or 14.5, mm -hmm. or you can do what some people are doing. You can let them get really ripe because they're trying to make these big, dense, slightly sweet, you know, wines and dilute them back, you know, hopefully. So you get to like 15 or something like that, but frequently they ended up at, end up at 16 with, you know, some residual sugar associated with them. So alcohol is like one of these funny things we, I try to pick, at that precise point where the wines come in between 14 and 15 percent alcohol and the wines are fresher that way than they are if you let them get riper and then water them back and they have more staying power and they're just <clears throat> better brightness mm -hmm. now on to balance this is a more complicated picture than anybody ever thought it was it turns out that because uh, of a thing called reverse osmosis uh, we've been able to play with alcohol so there's, uh, there, there have been several people who specialize in this. So it turns out that if you take a wine that is 16% alcohol and you reduce the alcohol level to 13.5, it actually may taste more alcoholic in terms of the way you feel it than it does at 16. Really? You know, and it, 
it also turns out that alcohol is not linear. So if you take and you take this wine that you've reduced to 13.5 and you add back alcohol in one tenth point increments, so 13.6, 13.7, 13.8, 13.9, you know, 14, et cetera, um, you'll find that there are what they call in the biz 